Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Listen for the word of the living God as we read these words. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. He said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? Whence the deeds of power being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their distrust. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts. But to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The living God still speaks today. Thanks be to God. We've heard that familiarity breeds contempt. In another sense, uh, we tend to stop looking at what has become overly familiar. We're often blind to what we assume we already know. It is difficult to turn fresh eyes on things that have long ago been assessed and we have determined that we know or understand them. When what we have assumed to be true is challenged, it can be difficult for us to take stock, to seriously evaluate our preconceived ideas and notions. Those assumptions have seemingly served us well. They've brought us to this point and place in time. But what do we do when we are surprised by Jesus, with whom we are already well familiar? Officially, at least, I've been driving since I was 15. My sister did put me behind the wheel of a car when I was 12. But I've driven well over 50 different vehicles over the years, cars and trucks, along with a tractor or two. I never really learned, however, to recognize when something was wrong with the vehicle I happened to be driving. Perhaps it's that I've had so many different driving experiences in vehicles and driving conditions beyond fuel, oil, filters, air pressure. All I really know about cars is getting behind the wheel and driving. I tend to ignore the mechanics. 
I have strong expectations that I get behind the wheel and the car will obey me. So when something's out of sorts, I don't notice. When Pat hands me the keys to tra Taylor's truck, I expect to get behind the wheel, crank the engine, and drive. I check the lights and the response of steering and brakes and accelerator before I'm out of the driveway. Everything else, I just assume will go as expected, right? Other details fall aside. I may chalk them up to differences from one vehicle to the next. It often takes someone else to draw my attention when something needs a mechanic's intervention. If the vehicle drives, it's working just fine. That's what vehicles do, right? When Jesus comes to his hometown in today's passage from Mark, there are expectations placed upon him as well. The townsfolk knew who he was. They had seen him growing up among themselves. Jesus was already a known quantity. Despite reports of his amassing and teaching crowds, they knew him too well to get caught up in all the hoopla surrounding him. Like the kid coming home from college, he was supposed to settle into that space. He was supposed to seemingly go right back to what space he occupied before he ever left. Nothing should have really changed while he was gone. Time was supposed to have passed, but no one had broken the mold that he had always been assigned. When the mold no longer fit, there would be conflict. Mom used to tell me an expert was just a briefcase-carrying ordinary pert who happened to be at least 50 miles from home. You couldn't be an expert if you were at home. We tend to give room for there being homegrown experts. And yet we treat outsiders with a little more leeway to teach us something new. We don't quite have the same preconceived notions about who they are that we attach to those who grew up at our feet. We expect to have to learn about them. They may still shock and confuse us in many ways, but the expectations that we have for them are a bit more fluid. Fluid. That's the term that we heard often in missionary orientation when Karen and I were going back the second time in preparation to be career missionaries in Brazil. They said it was no longer enough that we be flexible. We needed to be fluid. We needed to adapt to whatever space was presented to us, regardless of its shape, regardless of our former shape. We needed to open ourselves to learning a wholly new way of living that would most likely shatter many of our preconceived notions of life, society, and human relationship. It would not be enough to adapt the forms we knew to a new context. We would need to create new forms for new contexts. 
That's a tall order for mere mortals. I've spent my entire lifetime developing the molds and systems and knowledge and expectations that I bring with me to this very moment and place. At any given moment, my lenses and expectations are a product of my lifetime experience all the way up to this particular moment. My expectations may have been stretched and transformed by living in many places, contexts, languages, and cultures. I still bring expectations with me, even if they do not mesh neatly with yours. That's how we move through the world. It's how we make sense of what we see, what we hear, what we do, feel, and experience. It's how we build our concept of reality. It's in that created reality, that picture of how life functions, that we find whatever security we might personally have. Jesus no longer fit the expectations of him back home. He had risen and moved past the expectations, definitions, and understandings the home folk had of him. It wasn't just the town folk either. Remember three chapters back when Jesus was at a home elsewhere and his mother and brothers and sisters had come to fetch him and set him straight? There was something about Jesus' ministry, Jesus' healing and teaching that did not conform to any of his home folks' expectations of him. Apparently, he had not been giving life to clay birds. He had not been healing sick people. He had not been correcting his teachers or resurrecting friends from the dead during his childhood, adolescence. He had not grown up as a miracle worker or as a teacher of the law. Coming back home, Jesus was no longer who he had been. He was not the day laborer going into the fields at their side, building walls, mending fences, caring for the family's animals. That he had changed meant he no longer fit their expectations or their categories. He did not walk, talk, or act the way they expected him to. He had grown past those constrictions, those limitations. And they had not been around to see the changes occurring in him, through him, and around him. Coming face to face with the transformation they were seeing, made them uncomfortable. It made them very uncomfortable. We don't like being uncomfortable. We don't like having our expectations be trashed. We like it even less when our discomfort forces us to take a new look at what we thought we already understood. It's a lot easier to brush new information aside than it is to change our ideas, to incorporate new developments. It takes a substantial degree of self-confidence to accept that we will be all right should our understanding of God, of people, 
of ourselves, of best practices, shift, change. Our human tendency is to fight against change, to fight challenge, to fight new ways of being, of doing, of thinking. Sometimes we find it much simpler to assess what we know of the messenger rather than respond to the message itself. When the local boy comes back home, we find it hard to process how he may have changed due to experiences, exposure, or education that we have never had. Demeaning the messenger gives us an easy way out. It means we don't have to listen or assess new ideas. We don't learn much in the process, but we get to cling to our established ways a little more comfortably. We plug our ears to pretend there wasn't anything we really needed to assess after all. Meanwhile, Jesus continues on with his ministry. He allows the home folk to stick to their ways as he sends his disciples off to carry his message throughout the countryside. People less familiar with him and his disciples would be more open to assess what they had to say than townsfolk with a fixed notion of who he was. They would not be as tempted to look at Jesus and his disciples from a lens of familiarity, from a mold they had already created, a mold he was supposed to fit. The more important issue at hand, the more reticent we are to open ourselves to reassessing it fully and without prejudice. How well do we really know Jesus? Have we created too restrictive a mold for him to fit? Or are we willing to embrace a journey of continued discovery with him? If we're not more open to being transformed as we come to know him better, we can easily degrade him into a fixed quantity that can never measure up to Jesus' fullness. Have we become overly familiar with our ideas about him? If we're not careful, we could end up denying him in the process. 